yeah, thank you very much for asking me to come. Um, I've had a great time visiting and meeting Edward and looking for everything here. I've got one piece to read that's directly inspired by Mill and what's going on here and for the Sea Art Week. Um, but I've bought um, a couple of other pieces loosely based on the theme that are from the past. Um, and one of them relates to this. Or part, this is only part of what it relates to. So, there you go. This is the first one. And it's not on poetry tonight, because I've been reading a lot of poetry. Going back to prose for a bit. Four years ago, we collected a pine cone, hard as stone. There were no gaps or spaces between the folds of the cone. It sat in my hands, heavy as a rock. But unlike a rock, this weight was full of promise, full of trees. This cone, the perfect container for seeds of the stone pine, rested silent, heavy, dormant on the windowsill. It sat there for months, then for a year, then for another. It moved house, changed locations, then took its place in a group of three cones on a plate painted with a sunflower by my daughter Rosa. And there it stayed, silent, heavy, sleeping. Three more years passed and then it changed. The cone shifted in its woody way from stone to flower. Unseen, its fronds had opened like petals and resting around the cone on the green and yellow of the sunflower plate were the seeds silent pips of potential, one step closer to their purpose of contributing to a woodland, a forest. We gathered the seeds, put them in a film canister and popped them in the freezer into the deep cold of a long, hard winter, silent and still dormant. Spring came and we thought it worth a try. We took the seeds from their artificial winter and laid them in earth. We turned up the heat with the month of May and the surround of a glass house and we waited. One, two, three small green curls beneath the earth at first, then ten. Now more than fifty are beginning to stand straight, pushing the seed coat from the unfurling leaves, delicate green needles sowing promise into the air. It's nature, but it feels like a miracle. From stone to flower, from plate to earth, from seed to tree. And us? Our watching shifts from curiosity to wonder, to tenderness, to hope, to joy. These sprouted seeds will now be nurtured and then handed on to the next generation, our children, our nephews and nieces, who can watch them grow and find a place for them to flourish. And one day, maybe, watch new cones form. This small but wonderful experience brought a favourite haiku to mind. This tree knows peace well, rooted here many decades, no better teacher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And the we that I'm referring to is me and Rob. <laughs> we found that stone pine Thank you. in another country. <laughs> 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 um, this next piece is also a prose piece and um, it might seem a bit unusual to read tonight, but I just thought it's about Cumbria and Cumbrian traditions. Um, and actually Donna's just arrived, which makes it a little bit more relevant because Donna's been involved in the Sheep Fest over in Sedba. And if you haven't been, go. Um, I've been getting to know quite a few farmers in Cumbria over the, the last few years. Um, and this is recounts a day I spent uh, with a farmer in um, the Dudden Valley called Anthony. And it's called the softness of a chastity belt. <laughs> it's a cold morning in the Dudden Valley. The stones in the beck are iced like cupcakes with a sprinkling of snow. The roads are icy. The sun is yet to come over the hills into the yard. At Turner Hall Farm, behind a split barn door painted wine red, Anthony is sitting on a long, a long bale of hay, with a large sheep lying between his legs. I know how that sounds, but I can't think of another way to say it. That is what's happening. Andrew, who has helped out on Anthony's farm for 19 years, is standing above another sheep whose four legs are roped together. 
It lies motionless on the floor. Beyond, against the back wall, around 30 sheep are huddled together, waiting. The sheep in Anthony's lap lies with its head lolling off the end of the bale. For a moment it seems to be lifeless, but then it moves its head and attempts a wiggle. Anthony holds it for long enough to stitch a piece of cloth over its tail. This is clouting, an age-old practice among hill farmers that allows young ewes to go out and onto the fell without being impregnated by a ram. <coughs> it makes for a better sheep in the long run, says Anthony. We always do this with the shearlings. With their soft chastity belts on, these sheep that are 18 months old and have had one shear, which is why they're shearlings, will rejoin the main flock for the next few months. It's traditional for fell sheep to wait until their second year, when they become two shears, before getting topped. But most farmers separate their sheep, um, separate the young ones from the rest of the flock, so not many still clout. The red velvet material that Anthony is sewing over the tails of this sheep is wonderfully festive, and I could even say it's flattering on a herdwick. <laughs> Each piece of cat flap shaped cloth has a shine and softness that would grace the lining of any coat, but it wasn't chosen for colour, it was simply the best Anthony could find, flexible, strong and unlikely to fray. Each year the colour of the clouts is different. Anthony's hands work deftly over the material, his right hand splayed over the patch as his left stitches. After each piece is stitched, Anthony rests the needle in his mouth while tying the final knot. Andrew takes the needle from Anthony's mouth, threads it and sticks it into an old feed bag ready for the next sheep. It's a gentle partnership that will see them doing perhaps a hundred ewes in one day. There's a tender poetry in this very practical task, just as there is in the act of gathering the sheep in from the fells. There is calm, efficiency and grace in the movement of the men. Despite nearly two decades of hands-on experience on the farm, Andrew is wary of clouting any of Anthony's sheep, lest he gets it wrong. I know it's a real honour to be given a go, and this is where I get a true feeling for just how heavy and unwieldy a sheep can be. Anthony lifts a swelled LU onto my lap. I grip her back end with my thighs and shift around until I feel balanced. I reach for the red velvet. Andrew passes me a needle and thread, and I begin. The wool is so thick it's hard to find the base of it, and my fears of piercing the sheep's skin with the needle are unfounded. I fasten the wool on the top right corner, with Anthony guiding me to secure it properly and work my way around. I'm a lot slower than Anthony, and the sheep becomes restless, trying to kick itself free. It's a challenge to stitch and hold at the same time. I do make it around the material, though, and before tying the knot, Anthony shows me how to check that it's done properly. I have to put my hand right up under the fleshy tail flap into a world that's warm, moist and utterly foreign. <laughs> and then I fasten the end with as tight a knot as I can manage. My hands and thighs are stiff when I'm done. I ask Anthony if he'll leave this one as it is or re-stitch the cloth himself later on. He says no, but if it fails, he'll know it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> Not because it's failed. <laughs> He's left-handed. He finishes his stitching with the knot on the right, while my knot is on the left. I'll have to wait until the spring to see if the ewe I've clouted is safely through the winter. <laughs> Because that piece is a little bit old now, I can tell you that it worked. Yay! <laughs> I can do it again this year. Um, this is a, a little micro poem uh, called Remember. Night walk, cool air, caresses, bright moon. Remember this, say the peewits. <laughs> up in Scotland under one of those moons that's the super moon. You know, you always have a super moon. That's another super moon. And this one, Edward, thank you very much for spending so much time with me and showing me around. Um, I've been completely inspired by this place and you might recognise some of your words in this. And I'll call it Cagmaggery in the Mill. <laughs> On the edge of the sprint, 
In mind, river humming the earth's intent. In mind, human life. All that we are, all that we do, all that we make, all that we keep, all that we throw away. A way of thinking. The mind sight to see the beauty of forgotten things. Gathered, treasured, arranged. Order, order, says the book that brings Cagmagory into letters and numbers. A system of sense for items of lost sense. Washers, screws, shavings, dreams, memories, musings, handles, stones, bottles, names, faces, stories. Man's art in wood, woman's art in paint, child's art in paper, God's art in the passage of time and water and air, in scrapings of rust and smoothness of stone, and the chant of the cockerel on the breeze from the beck. And in this backbone, time and place, calcified pebbles in piano's pegs, are the keys to Cagmagory, where in what is lost something is found, and this unplayed piano still holds a tune.